This morning I invite you to open up your Bibles to a, a very small letter uh, near the very back of your Bibles. It's a little book titled uh, The Third Letter of John, or Three John. Um, and while you're finding that in the back of your Bibles, um, I just want to make mention of a, of a couple of things. This is part of a, of a series of more topical um, sermons that I've been giving as we are getting off the ground. So in our first study, we looked at how the gospel of Jesus crucified for our sins and raised for our justification is the glue that will hold us all together. And then we looked at, um, uh, at Jesus, um, the kinds of people that Jesus would welcome, uh, people from all walks of life, skeptics and believers and everybody in between. And so this is our posture towards the world also, to be welcoming to others. And then we looked at what does Jesus welcome them to? He welcomes them to a life of discipleship, a life where they learn the obedience of faith. So this is what we are doing on Sundays mostly, and if we eventually get to home groups and so on, that, um, that will help during the week. But we are trying to learn as Christians how to have our lives shaped by Christ through his word into the obedience of faith. But this morning I want to address another topic, um, something that we may not always connect with Christian life, but one that is a, a very hopeful prospect of a Christian life together with other people over a long period of time. It's that eventually, in time, there is the prospect of you building really good friendships with people within your church community, people that you will get close to. Perhaps not everyone, but some of the people here you will draw very close to and become very, very well acquainted with. So that's what I want to think about this morning. Gospel-shaped friendships. So, before we begin, let me pray for us. That the Lord might bless our time together here. Father, you have always done amazing things through your word. Through your word, the world was created. Through your word, you stopped Pharaoh. Through your word... You created your people to come and worship. And through your word, Father, we ask that you would now revive our souls and grant us faith that we might see and believe and apply. We ask us that we might be a people holy unto Christ, that we might be his witness to all the ends of the earth. Amen. So this morning I mentioned that um, I want to speak on the, on the topic of friendships because it's not something that we typically or naturally connect to church life or perhaps even to the scriptures. We don't think that the scriptures has an awful lot to say about friendships. And for some of us, um, friendships can occur quite naturally. And for others, we find friendship a little bit harder to come by. It takes a little bit more work. Uh, one of our family's most favorite uh, British murder mysteries is called um, McDonald and Dodds. Uh, McDonald and Dodds. And in one episode, uh, there's a, a scene that captures the struggle of friendship very well. Uh, during one of their many investigations, the older gentleman, Sergeant Dodds, explains why he doesn't see many of his old friends as much as he'd like. He says to his younger colleague, uh, when men get to my time of life, they isolate themselves, you know, socially. And then his younger colleague, who is very socially active, is somewhat thrown by that comment that in older age, some men tend to isolate themselves from friendships. And she quickly moves on to change the topic. But there's a certain sadness in that scene of an older man who desires friendship but struggling to find it in the later seasons of his life. So as we turn our minds to friendships, I know there are people among us here who are naturals at it. Your, a, your capacity to befriend people is enormous. You can befriend just about anyone at any time. But for others, be aware that making friends takes a little bit more effort. And then there are those for whom friendships is a kind of topic that they've left buried for a while because of perhaps betrayal of friendship that's happened to them in the past. 
So we all bring things to the table this morning. We all have thoughts on what it requires to make a friend or how to be one. As we do this, I want us to think this morning particularly about friendship in biblical terms. As we'll discover in our passage, there are a number of traits, a number of aspects that all of us can develop in order to create really healthy Christian friendships with one another. It gives us clues on how we might develop and maintain the friendships we desire in Christian life. So if you have your Bible open, I'm reading from 3 John, and I'm going to read for us the first four verses. These are the words of God. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. You know, verse 1 really sets the stage for us in terms of friendship. As I read it here, I read it from the ESV, and it simply says the beloved Gaius. The beloved Gaius. And that's accurate. But when we tend to think of words like beloved in the Bible, we think of them as a bit of soppy embellishment, right? <laughs> oh, the beloved. <laughs> that's just a, it, it's, it's sort of a, a, a sensationalized way of expressing your affections. As a merely superficial gesture, perhaps. But don't gloss over that word beloved too quickly. There's a depth of meaning here that's worth knowing about. Now, as we look at other English translations of the Bible, they tend to draw out this meaning a little bit further. And some translate this simply as the beloved guidance. But others go a step further to get to the point, my good friend, my good friend guidance. My dear brother, my dear friend. Now, Gaius was much more than a mere acquaintance to the author. Gaius, as, much as some of our translations try to show, was a close friend, a dear friend. Someone whom John, the author, was very affectionate towards. And the author draws explicit attention to the quality of his friendship when he says to the beloved Gaius whom I love. He's not only a dear friend, but he loves his dear friend. And he's able to say it. And so the question is, how did Gaius and the Apostle John, who authored this letter, find themselves in such a remarkable friendship? How did this happen? How did this friendship blossom? As we think about that question, there's another question I want us to ask ourselves, and that's this. How could we think about developing friendships in which we are able to say of our friends in Christian community that I love that person? That I really love that person, that that person is dear to me, and that I love them. And I'm going to suggest to you this morning that there are at least three aspects that are needful to develop and maintain rich and meaningful friendships in Christian life. Three basic things that we could try and do in order to establish and maintain dearly cherished Christian friendships. And they all come in pairs. <laughs> That's fortunate for a person like me who's preaching. Things come in pairs and they come in threes. So firstly, the first pair is that meaningful friendships, to develop meaningful friendships, we do need love and truth. 
We need love and truth. We see this in verses 1. The beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Whom I love in truth. It's not... Um, for John, this is not a choice between two good alternatives. To the beloved guys whom I love, or to the, or the beloved guys whom I am truthful towards. It is not either or, it is um, what, both at the same time. We need not invest in both, uh, we need to invest, we do need to invest in both love and truth in order to develop biblically healthy Christian friendships. And you probably know this from experience. This is not news to you, but you know this from experience. You can think of uh, your life and your friendships, and you can perhaps point to some friendships that you knew were going to be incapable of deepening. They always just sort of stayed at a friendly level, but never at a really deep level. It never really got anywhere. It's fine. It's not, it's not a criticism, but you just knew that it, you wish there was more to the friendship. And perhaps the reason is this. It's because the friendship was trying to hobble along on one leg. It was trying to hobble along the leg of truth, but lacking genuine love between the two people. These friendships, those friendships which tend to um, lean on truth more than love, tend to be informationally rich friendships. You, you can exchange lots of information and transfer lots of information between you two but the relationship tends to be a bit poor. These friendships tend to be capable of talking for hours and hours and hours about theological interests and doctrines and global maneuverings, but they lack meaningful capacity to talk on a more personal level. We can take the guard down. We can express your heart without being taken the wrong way. On the flip side, we know that some of our relationships never tend to deepen because they hobble along on the other leg, the leg of affirmative love, but a, a, a relationship that shows a remarkable lack of interest or concern for the truth. As a consequence, these friendships tend to lack a meaningful contribution to one another's spiritual development. They, they're, they're friendships that affirm us in everything that we do, but never bother to point out to us that we might have areas that we could grow in as Christians. They do not contribute to our spiritual formation and therefore not to our maturity or our obedience to Christ. You know, in this regard, Timothy Keller uh, made a very excellent observation. He said, love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us but keeps us in denial about our flaws. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. And yet, I want to suggest to you, between the Apostle John and Gaius, we see a balanced investment of both love and truth in their relationship. They're doing both. And that's certainly one aspect I want you to keep in mind as you think about developing or deepening stable and desirable Christian friendships. That you might develop friendships that could reach a point where you say, I really love that person and I will be really truthful to that person. So let's make note of this. Whether we're new to forming Christian friendships or looking to improve old friendships, this is key. In committing to friendships, we do need to make room for both truth and love. This, after all, is the shape that the gospel does give our friendships. This is what the gospel does to our friendships. It's the way the gospel influences our friendships. Because it's the way that Jesus has befriended us. Jesus befriends us this way. He's radically invested in love toward us because he demonstrates his, his unconditional commitment to us 
forgiving us our sins, and He has radic radically invested in truth toward us because He doesn't sugarcoat our sins. He's willing to name things that we could grow in. As Timothy Keller also pointed out, God's saving love in Christ, however, is marked by both radical truthfulness about who we are and yet also radical, unconditional commitment to us. The merciful commitment strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves and repent. The conviction and repentance moves us to cling to and rest in God's mercy and grace. So, if you're willing to take that step, that risk of developing friendship with some people in the church, it will require, if it is to become a meaningful friendship, it will require love and truth. And this is really just another way of saying we want our friendships to look a lot like the gospel. We want all of the gospel in our friendships. So that's our first thing. Love and truth. And as we move out of verse 1 and into the following three verses, there are two other aspects that are, develop, uh, that are needful for developing and maintaining Christian friendships. We see that meaningful Christian friendships show a care for each other's physical as well as spiritual well-being, our spiritual health. And we see this in verse 2. John says to his beloved friend, Beloved, I pray that it all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. So, in the first verse, he's already shown us that they are invested in both love and truth for each other, and now he shows us that he is investing also in the physical care for his friend, as well as his, the spiritual care of his friend. But I ask you now, how often do we sabotage the prospects of deepening friendship because we neglect to attend to a friend's either physical or spiritual well-being. We do that, don't we? We sabotage the prospect of a deepening friendship because we neglect to attend to either their physical or spiritual needs. We know this from experience, some of our friendships simply stagnate at the level of physical concern. We call each other, and that's good, we call each other and we ask, how's your health? How's your kids? Have you been getting enough sleep? These are good things to ask. They're legitimate and often well-intended concerns. In fact, when my closest friends call and ask those questions, I am often grateful. Because I'm, gra I'm grateful because I know that's not the only question they're going to ask. But their asking is genuine. They do mean it. But if physical well-being, if conversations about the weather, our jobs, our holiday plans, our health issues, if that's the only thing we talked about in our friendships, our capacity for deepening friendship is often hindered. As important as these physical things are, and John does express a genuine interest in the physical well-being of his friend Gaius, our friendships won't mature if we restrict them to the level of physical concern only. But as you read the passage, isn't it interesting how John shows us it's very normal. <laughs> it's, it's, not a, it's not a strange thing for Christians to wade into conversations about each other's spiritual well-being. You know, we might, we might um, break the ice um, with uh, interest in each other's physical well-being. 
and we may need to respond to a need that is expressed. But the conversation, it's okay for the conversation to develop. It's okay for the conversation to put a toe in the water and ask about each other's spiritual well-being also. You note this in verse 2. I pray that it may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. I hope it goes well for you physically, guys. But I also hope it goes well for your soul. Now John here demonstrates for us by example an interest in both the physical and spiritual well-being of his friend. That is to say, these two friends have developed a well-balanced friendship in which conversation could go in, in various directions, in many healthy directions. They could talk about their stubbed toes and they could talk about their stubborn hearts. They could talk about the joys of perhaps driving well-built sports cars, but they could also talk about their steps of maturity that they're taking towards Christ. They didn't have to choose between the many good things there is to talk about in Christian life. They could talk about both. It's all there in a well-balanced package of friendship which shows a caring commitment to each other's physical and spiritual health. So those are two things I want you to just make note of so far. Love and truth and then an interest in each other's physical and spiritual health. And then we're going to add just one more, one more aspect to developing good, healthy Christian friendships. Friendships, Christian friendships require both giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. Verse 3 and 4 teaches us this insight. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. The thing that John and Gaius was giving and receiving, the exchange taking place here in this friendship was an affirmation, an affirmation that the gospel was making a real difference to the shape and direction of their lives. That is what they were affirming and receiving affirmation of. Gaius, you're walking in the truth. I can see that the gospel is making a real difference to the way that you live your life. And that gives John a great sense of joy in his friendship. So in that statement, for I, great, uh, I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified, you are walking in the truth. In this, John received from his friend, Gaius, he's receiving from his friend an affirmation that the gospel was central to Gaius' life. That it had, has an unmistakable influence on the way that Gaius lived. And you know, you probably know this from experience, that friendship with people like that, where the gospel is just marking them so profoundly that there is a real intentionality about the way that they live as Christians, it's remarkably attractive, isn't it? Isn't it so attractive to hang around with Christians like that? Christians who are in it, who are intentional about the way that they see life and approach it. I think it is. I, 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 when I think about the friendships that I have very much enjoyed in my life, those are the ones that stand out as the most attractive. And often those friendships stand out in spite of great geographical and even the age differences that exist between me and my friends. The friendships that have endured. The friendships, the Christian friendships that have endured in my life are those where we are able to point out ways in which the gospel continues to shape 
and renew us throughout the course of our lives. Just as an example, there's a, an older friend of mine, that he, he's an older gentleman, he's perhaps in his 80s now. Uh, he was a, a man that gave me a lot of his time when I first became a Christian. And we nurtured a friendship over a couple of decades now. But just last year, someone mentioned to me how they continued to see him in his old age, serving his family and his church. And that's that thing, isn't it? Just hearing about him walking in the truth to borrow John's words. It did me a great deal of good. Probably the way that hearing about Gaius did John a great deal of good, that he rejoiced greatly to hear that his friend is still walking in the truth. That's the kind of giving and receiving that, I'm have, that I have in mind here. When we hear from others how the gospel is making a difference, we are able to receive that as an affirmation that yes, that dear friend is walking in the truth. On the negative side, hasn't some of the greatest pains of friendship in your life come from those friends? Uh, the, the greatest pains doesn't come from friends who challenge our sin, or even friendships that seem to hit a bit of a rough patch or a dry patch from time to time. Isn't it that our greatest pains in friendship often comes from hearing once gospel-motivated friends who have deserted their love for Christ and the church. Those friendships, those stories of the gospel no longer meaningfully influencing, shaping or refocusing the life of those friends of ours. Those have been the most painful experiences of friendship, I think. But we are stating the point positively here. Gospel friendships are developed and maintained when friends give and receive affirmation of the gospel making impact on each other's lives. We can get off the phone and go, yeah, isn't it, isn't it lovely? How they're thinking about this particular issue in their lives through the gospel. Isn't it interesting how they're dealing with that difficult working relationship, that difficult trouble at their workplace? But thinking about how Christ might resolve something like that. Indeed, this is exactly what John wrote, that he rejoiced when he heard that Gaius was walking in the truth, and that he has no greater joy than to hear that his children, those are likely fellow Christians, are walking in the truth also. So, this morning we've taken a bit um, of a look at a number of aspects for developing and maintaining meaningful friendships in Christian life. What will it take for us to do it? And through the friendship uh, of John and his friend Gaius, and we've seen that healthy Christian friendships will require love and truth, they will require physical and spiritual care, and they require giving and receiving of gospel affirmation. If this is true, if these are um, basic uh, ingredients to Christian friendship, perhaps it is time for us to assess our friendships in Christian life also. And even to think about our disappointments that we've uh, experienced in friendship. And re just a reminder, Jesus too um, experienced disappointment in friendships. There was a friend who was a Judas in Jesus' life. There was a friend who said, I will never ever abandon you, Jesus, but who betrayed him at least three times. J 
Jesus does know what a disappointment in friendship feels like. But as we think about our own friendships, and we think about the friendship, we, the steps that we could take to cultivate these kinds of friendships, the friendships that we really need, and actually the friendships we really desire, we have to think about these things, don't we? We have to think about how we're putting these things in the mixing bowl. Have we left out ingredients? Are we baking the wrong cake? You know, to be sure, as we think about this, as we think about how we're applying these elements to our friendship, Sam Storms was very helpful. He reminds, he's an author, um, and he, he, he just wrote a, a, a lovely book on friendship, but he, he, he makes the comment, not everyone, mark this, not everyone is a candidate to be a friend. Just be open-eyed about that in a Christian life. Not everyone is a candidate to be your friend. Some people prove themselves untrustworthy. Some people still lack the graces in which, it is ne in which the necessary trust for a meaningful friendship can be built. So not everyone can be your closest friend. And that's fine. Even Jesus did not befriend everybody. Even Jesus did not befriend everybody. He loved everybody, but he only befriended a few. Jesus loves everybody, but he only befriends a few. And those who were most intimately befriended by Jesus knew something of his commitment to love them and to be truthful with them. To be concerned with their physical well-being as well as their spiritual well-being. And to be delighted when there was evidence of the gospel shaping and renewing their lives. The most intimate friendships we commit to will surely have echoes of Jesus' friendships with his disciples also. Let me pray for us before we return to the Lord in song.